Chapter 18 of Specimen Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David J. Quay. Specimen Days by Walt Whitman. Chapter 18. Birds and a Caution. May 14. Home again, down temporarily in the Jersey woods. Between 8 and 9 a.m. a full concert of birds, from different quarters, in keeping with the fresh scent, the peace, the naturalness all around me. I am lately noticing the russet back, size of the robin or a trifle less, light breast and shoulders, with irregular dark stripes, tail long, sits hunched up by the hour these days, top of a tall bush or some tree singing blithely. I often get near and listen, as he seems tame. I like to watch the working of his bill and throat, the quaint sidle of his body, and the flex of his long tail. I hear the woodpecker, and night and early morning the shuttle of the whippoorwill. Noons the gurgle of the thrush delicious, and meow of the catbird. Many I cannot name, but I do not very particularly seek information. You must not know too much, or be too precise or scientific about birds, and trees, and flowers, and watercraft. A certain free margin and even vagueness, perhaps ignorance, credulity, helps your enjoyment of these things, and of the sentiment of feathered, wooded, river, or marine nature generally. I repeat it, don't want to know too exactly or the reasons why. My own notes have been written offhand in the latitude of middle New Jersey. Though they describe what I saw, what appeared to me, I dare say the expert ornithologist, botanist, or entomologist will detect more than one slip in them. Samples of my commonplace book. I ought not to offer a record of these days, interests, recuperations, without including a certain old, well-thumbed commonplace book, filled with favorite excerpts I carried in my pocket for three summers, and absorbed over and over again when the mood invited. I find so much in having a poem or fine suggestion sink into me, a little then goes a great ways, prepared by these vacant, sane, and natural influences. Note, samples of my commonplace book down at the creek. I have, says old Pinder, many swift arrows in my quiver which speak to the wise, though they need an interpreter to the thoughtless. Such a man as it takes ages to make and ages to understand. H.D. Thoreau. If you hate a man, don't kill him, but let him live. Buddhistic. Famous swords are made of refuse scraps, thought worthless. Poetry is the only verity, the expression of a sound mind speaking after the ideal, and not after the apparent. Emerson. The form of oath among the Shoshone Indians is, The earth hears me, the sun hears me, shall I lie? The true test of civilization is not the census, nor the size of cities, nor the crops. No, but the kind of man the country turns out. Emerson. The whole wide ether is the eagle's sway. The whole earth is a brave man's fatherland. Euripides. Spices crushed, their pungents yield. Trodden scents, their sweets respire. Would you have its strength revealed? Cast the incense in the fire. Matthew Arnold speaks of, quote, the huge Mississippi of falsehood called history, unquote. The wind blows north, the wind blows south, the wind blows east and west. No matter how the free wind blows, some ship will find it best. Preach not to others what they should eat, but eat as becomes you, and be silent. Epictetus. Victor Hugo makes a donkey meditate and apostrophize thus. My brother, man, if you would know the truth, we both are by the same dull walls shut in. The gate is massive and the dungeon strong, but you look through the keyhole out beyond and call this knowledge, yet have not at hand the key wherein to turn the fatal lock. William Cullen Bryant surprised me once, relates a writer in a New York paper, by saying that prose was the natural language of composition, and he wondered how anybody came to write poetry. Farewell, I did not know thy worth, but thou art gone, and now tis prized. So angels walked unknown on earth, but when they flew were recognized. Hood John Burroughs, writing of Thoreau, says, He improves with age, in fact requires age to take off a little of his asperity and fully ripen him. 
The world likes a good hater and refuser almost as well as it likes a good lover and acceptor, only it likes him farther off. Louise Michel at the Burial of Blanqui, 1881 Blanqui drilled his body to subjection to his grand conscience and his noble passions, and commencing as a young man, broke with all that is sybaritish in modern civilization. Without the power to sacrifice self, great ideas will never bear fruit. Out of the leaping furnace flame a mass of molten silver came, then beaten into pieces three, went forth to meet its destiny. The first a crucifix was made, within a soldier's knapsack laid. The second was a locket fair, where a mother kept her dead child's hair. The third a bangle bright and warm around a faithless woman's arm. A mighty pain to love it is, and tis a pain that pain to miss. But of all pain the greatest pain, it is to love, but love in vain. Maurice F. Egan on de Guerin. A pagan heart, a Christian soul had he. He followed Christ, yet for dead pan he sighed, till earth and heaven met within his breast. As if Theocritus in Sicily had come upon the figure crucified, and lost his gods in deep Christ-given rest. And if I pray the only prayer that moves my lips for me, is leave the mind that now I bear, and give me liberty. Emily Bronte I travel on not knowing, I would not if I might. I would rather walk with God in the dark than go alone in the light. I would rather walk with him by faith than pick my way by sight. End of note. My native sand and salt once more. July 25, 81, Far Rockaway, Long Island. A good day here, on a jaunt amid the sand and salt, a steady breeze setting in from the sea, the sun shining, the sedge odor, the noise of the surf, a mixture of hissing and booming, the milk-white crest curling. I had a leisurely bath and naked ramble as of old, on the warm gray shore sands, my companions off in a oat in deeper water, I shouting to them Jupiter's menaces against the gods, from Pope's Homer. July 28th to Long Branch, 8.5 a.m., on the steamer Plymouth Rock, foot of 23rd Street, New York, for Long Branch. Another fine day, fine sights, the shores, the shipping and bay, everything comforting to the body and spirit of me. I find the human and objective atmosphere of New York City and Brooklyn more affiliative to me than any other. An hour later, still on the steamer, now sniffing the salt very plainly, the long pulsating swash as our boat steams seaward, the hills of Navesink and many passing vessels, the air the best part of all. At Long Branch, the bulk of the day, stopped at a good hotel, took all very leisurely, had an excellent dinner, and then drove for over two hours about the place, especially Ocean Avenue, the finest drive one can imagine, seven or eight miles right along the beach. In all directions, costly villas, palaces, millionaires, but few among them I opine, like my friend George W. Childs, whose personal integrity, generosity, unaffected simplicity go beyond all worldly wealth. Hot weather, New York. August. In the big city a while, even the height of the dog days, there is a good deal of fun about New York, if you only avoid fluster and take all the buoyant wholesomeness that offers. More comfort, too, than most folks think. A middle-aged man with plenty of money in his pocket tells me that he has been off for a month to all the swell places, has dispersed a small fortune, has been hot and out of kilter everywhere, and has returned home and lived in New York City the last two weeks quite contented and happy. People forget when it is hot here, it is generally hotter still in other places. New York is so situated with a great ozonic brine on both sides, it comprises the most favorable health chances in the world. If only the suffocating crowding of some of its tenement houses could be broken up. I find I never sufficiently realized how beautiful are the upper two-thirds of Manhattan Island. I am stopping at Mott Haven, and have been familiar now for ten days with the region above 100th Street and along the Harlem River and Washington Heights. I am dwelling a few days with my friends Mr. and Mrs. J. H. J. and a merry houseful of young ladies, and putting the last touches on the printer's copy of my new volume of Leaves of Grass, the completed book at last. Work at it two or three hours, and then go down and loaf along the Harlem River. 
have just had a good spell of this recreation. The sun sufficiently veiled a soft south breeze, the river full of small or large shells, light taper boats, darting up and down, some singly, now and then long ones with six or eight young fellows practicing, very inspiriting sights. Two fine yachts lie anchored off the shore. I linger long, enjoying the sundown, the glow, the streaked sky, the heights, distances, shadows. August 10. As I haltingly ramble an hour or two this forenoon by the more secluded parts of the shore, or sit under an old cedar halfway up the hill, the city near in view, many young parties gather to bathe or swim, squads of boys, generally twos or threes, some larger ones, along the sand bottom, or off an old pier close by. A peculiar and pretty carnival, at its height a hundred lads or young men, very democratic, but all decent behaving. The laughter, voices, calls, re-responses, the springing and diving of the bathers from the great string piece of the decayed pier, where climbers stand long ranks of them, naked, rose-colored, with movements, postures ahead of any sculpture. To all this the sun so bright, the dark green shadow of the hills the other side, the amber rolling waves, changing as the tide comes in to a transparent tea-color, the frequent splash of the playful boys sousing, the glittering drops sparkling, and the good western breeze blowing. Custer's Last Rally Went today to see this just-finished painting by John Mulvaney, who has been out in far Dakota, on the spot, at the forts, and among the frontiersmen, soldiers, and Indians, for the last two years, on purpose to sketch it in from reality, or the best that could be got of it sat for over an hour before the picture, completely absorbed in the first view. A vast canvas, I should say twenty or twenty-two feet by twelve, all crowded and yet not crowded, conveying such a vivid play of color, it takes a little time to get used to it. There are no tricks, there is no throwing of shades in masses. It is all at first painfully real, overwhelming, needs good nerves to look at it. Forty or fifty figures, perhaps more, in full finish and detail in the midground with three times that number or more through the rest, swarms upon swarms of savage Sioux, in their war bonnets, frantic, mostly on ponies, driving through the background, through the smoke, like a hurricane of demons. A dozen of the figures are wonderful, altogether a western, autochthonic phase of America, the frontiers, culminating typical, deadly, heroic to the uttermost. Nothing in the books like it, nothing in Homer, nothing in Shakespeare, more grim and sublime than either, all native, all our own, and all a fact. A great lot of muscular, tan-faced men, brought to bay under terrible circumstances, death a hold of them, yet every man undaunted, not one losing his head, wringing out every cent of the pay before they sell their lives. Custer, his hair cut short, stands in the middle, with dilated eye and extended arm, aiming a huge cavalry pistol. Captain Cook is there, partially wounded, blood on the white handkerchief around his head, aiming his carbine coolly, half kneeling. His body was afterwards found close by Custer's. The slaughtered or half-slaughtered horses for breastworks make a peculiar feature. Two dead Indians, Herculean, lie in the foreground, clutching their Winchester rifles, very characteristic. The many soldiers, their faces and attitudes, the carbines, the broad-brimmed western hats, the powder smoke in puffs, the dying horses with their rolling eyes almost human in their agony, the clouds of war-bonneted Sioux in the background, the figures of Custer and Cook, with indeed the whole scene dreadful, yet with an attraction and beauty that will remain in my memory. With all its color and fierce action, a certain Greek countenance pervades it. A sunny sky and clear light envelop all. There is an almost entire absence of the stock traits of European war pictures. The physiognomy of the work is realistic and western. I only saw it for an hour or so, but it needs to be seen many times, needs to be studied over and over again. I could look on such a work at brief intervals all my life without tiring. It is very tonic to me. Then it has an ethic purpose below all, as all great art must have. The artist said the sending of the picture abroad, probably to London, had been talked of. I advised him if it went abroad to take it to Paris. I think they might appreciate it there, nay, they certainly would. Then I would like to show Monsieur Crepeau that some things can be done in America as well as others. Some Old Acquaintances, Memories 
August 16. Chalk a big mark for today, was one of the sayings of an old sportsman friend of mine, when he had had unusually good luck, come home thoroughly tired but with satisfactory results of fish or birds. Well, today might warrant such a mark for me. Everything propitious from the start. An hour's fresh stimulation coming down ten miles of Manhattan Island by railroad and eight o'clock stage. Then an excellent breakfast at Pfaff's restaurant, 24th Street. Our host himself, an old friend of mine, quickly appeared on the scene to welcome me and bring up the news, and, first opening a big fat bottle of the best wine in the cellar, talk about antebellum times, 59 and 60, and the jovial suppers at his then Broadway place, near Bleecker Street. Ah, the friends and names and frequenters, those times, that place. Most are dead. Ada Clare, Wilkins, Daisy Shepard, O'Brien, Henry Clapp, Stanley, Mullen, Wood, Brome, Arnold, all gone. And there Pfaff and I, sitting opposite each other at the little table, gave a remembrance to them in a style they would have themselves fully confirmed, namely big, brimming, filled-up champagne glasses, drained in abstracted silence, very leisurely to the last drop. Pfaff is a generous German restaurateur, silent, stout, jolly, and I should say the best selector of champagne in America. A Discovery of Old Age Perhaps the best is always cumulative. One's eating and drinking one wants fresh, and for the nonce right off and have done with it. But I would not give a straw for that person or poem or friend or city or work of art that was not more grateful the second time than the first, and more still the third. Nay, I do not believe any grandest eligibility ever comes forth at first. In my own experience, persons, poems, places, characters... I discover the best hardly ever at first, no absolute rule about it, however, sometimes suddenly bursting forth or stealthily opening to me, perhaps after years of unwitting familiarity, unappreciation, usage. A visit at the last to R. W. Emerson. Concord, Massachusetts. Out here on a visit, elastic, mellow, Indian summery weather. Came today from Boston, the pleasant ride of forty minutes by steam, through Somerville, Belmont, Waltham, Stony Brook, and other lively towns. Convoyed by my friend F. B. Sanborn to his ample house, and the kindness and hospitality of Mrs. S. and their fine family. I'm writing this under the shade of some old hickories and elms just after 4 p.m. on the porch within a stone's throw of the Concord River. Off against me across stream, on a meadow and side hill, haymakers are gathering and wagoning, in probably their second or third crop. The spread of emerald green and brown, the knolls, the score or two of little haycocks dotting the meadow, the loaded-up wagons, the patient horses, the slow, strong action of the men in pitchforks, all in the just waning afternoon, with patches of yellow sunsheen mottled by long shadows, a cricket shrilly chirping, herald of the dusk, a boat with two figures noiselessly gliding along the little river, passing under the stone bridge arch the slight settling haze of aerial moisture, the sky and the peacefulness expanding in all directions and overhead, fill and soothe me. Same evening. Never had I a better piece of luck befall me, a long and blessed evening with Emerson, in a way I couldn't have wished better or different. For nearly two hours he has been placidly sitting where I could see his face in the best light near me, Mrs. S.'s back parlor well filled with people, neighbors, many fresh and charming faces, women mostly young but some old. My friend A.B. Alcott and his daughter Louisa were there early. A good deal of talk, the subject Henry Thoreau, some new glints of his life and fortunes, with letters to and from him, one of the best by Margaret Fuller, others by Horace Greeley, Channing, etc., one from Thoreau himself, most quaint and interesting. No doubt I seemed very stupid to the room full of company, taking hardly any part in the conversation, but I had my own pail to milk in, as the Swiss proverb puts it. My seat and the relative arrangement were such that, without being rude or anything of the kind, I could just look squarely at Emerson, which I did a good part of the two hours. On entering, he had spoken very briefly and politely to several of the company, then settled himself in his chair, a trifle pushed back, and, though a listener and apparently an alert one, remained silent through the whole talk and discussion. A lady friend quietly took a seat next to him to give special attention. 
a good color in his face, eyes clear, with a well-known expression of sweetness, and the old, clear-peering aspect quite the same. Next day. Several hours at Emerson's house and dinner there. An old familiar house, he has been in it thirty-five years, with surroundings, furnishment, roominess, and plain elegance and fullness, signifying democratic ease, sufficient opulence, and an admirable old-fashioned simplicity. Modern luxury, with its mere sumptuousness and affectation, either touched lightly upon or ignored altogether. Dinner the same. Of course, the best of the occasion, Sunday, September 18, 81, was the sight of Emerson himself. As just said, a healthy color in the cheeks and a good light in the eyes, cheery expression, and just the amount of talking that best suited, namely, a word or short phrase only where needed, and almost always with a smile. Besides Emerson himself, Mrs. Emerson, with their daughter Ellen, the son Edward and his wife, with my friend F.S. and Mrs. S., and others, relatives and intimates. Mrs. Emerson, resuming the subject of the evening before, I sat next to her, gave me further and fuller information about Thoreau, who years ago, during Mr. Emerson's absence in Europe, had lived for some time in the family by invitation. Other Conquered Notations Though the evening at Mr. and Mrs. Sanborn's and the memorable family dinner at Mr. and Mrs. Emerson's have most pleasantly and permanently filled my memory, I must not slight other notations of Concord. I went to the old manse, walked through the ancient garden, entered the rooms, noted the quaintness, the unkempt grass and bushes, the little panes in the windows, the low ceilings, the spicy smell, the creepers embowering the light. Went to the Concord battleground, which is close by, scanned French's statue, the Minuteman, read Emerson's poetic inscription on the base, lingered a long while on the bridge, and stopped by the grave of the unnamed British soldiers buried there the day after the fight in April, 75. Then riding on, thanks to my friend Miss M. and her spirited white ponies, she driving them. A half hour at Hawthorne's and Thoreau's graves. I got out and went up, of course, on foot, and stood a long while and pondered. They lie close together in a pleasant wooded spot well up on the cemetery hill, Sleepy Hollow. The flat surface of the first was densely covered by myrtle, with a border of arbor vita, and the other had a brown headstone, moderately elaborate with inscriptions. By Henry's side lies his brother John, of whom much was expected, but he died young. Then to Walden Pond, that beautiful embowered sheet of water, and spent over an hour there. On the spot in the woods where Thoreau had his solitary house is now quite a cairn of stones to mark the place. I too carried one and deposited on the heap. As we drove back, saw the school of philosophy, but it was shut up, and I would not have it opened for me. Nearby stopped at the house of W. T. Harris, the Hegelian, who came out and we had a pleasant chat while I sat in the wagon. I shall not soon forget those conquered drives, and especially that charming Sunday forenoon, one with my friend Miss M. and the White Ponies. Boston Common, more of Emerson. October 10 through 13. I spend a good deal of time on the Common, these delicious days and nights, every midday from 11.30 to about 1, and almost every sunset another hour. I know all the big trees, especially the old elms along Tremont and Beacon Streets, and have come to a sociable, silent understanding with most of them in the sunlit air, yet crispy cool enough, as I saunter along the wide, unpaved walks. Up and down this breadth by Beacon Street, between these same old elms, I walked for two hours, of a bright, sharp February midday twenty-one years ago with Emerson, then in his prime, keen, physically and morally magnetic, armed at every point, and when he chose, wielding the emotional just as well as the intellectual. During those two hours he was the talker and I the listener. It was an argument statement, reconnoitering, review, attack, and pressing home, like an army corps in order, artillery, cavalry, infantry. Of all that could be said against that part and a main part in the construction of my poems, Children of Adam, more precious than gold to me that dissertion. It afforded me ever after this strange and paradoxical lesson. Each point of Emerson's statement was unanswerable, no judge's charge ever more complete or convincing. I could never hear the points better put. 
and then I felt down in my soul the clear and unmistakable conviction to disobey all and pursue my own way. "'What have you to say, then, to such things?' said Emerson, pausing in conclusion. "'Only that while I can't answer them at all, I feel more settled than ever to adhere to my own theory and exemplify it,' was my candid response. Whereupon we went and had a good dinner at the American house, and thenceforward I never wavered or was touched with qualms, as I confess I had been two or three times before. "'An Ossianic Night, Dearest Friends. November 81. Again back in Camden. As I cross the Delaware in long trips tonight, between nine and eleven, the scene overhead is a peculiar one. Swift sheets of flitting vapor gauze, followed by dense clouds throwing an inky pall on everything. Then a spell of that transparent steel-gray-black sky I have noticed under similar circumstances, on which the moon would beam for a few moments with calm luster, throwing down a broad dazzle of highway on the waters. Then the mists careering again, all silently yet driven as if by the furies they sweep along, sometimes quite thin, sometimes thicker, a real oceanic night, amid the whirl, absent or dead friends, the old, the past, somehow tenderly suggested, while the gale strains chant themselves from the mists, Be thy soul blessed, O Kareel, in the midst of thy eddying winds, that thou wouldst come to my hall when I am alone by night, and thou dost come, my friend. I hear often thy light hand on my harp, when it hangs on the distant wall, and the feeble sound touches my ear. Why dost thou not speak to me in my grief, and tell me when I shall behold my friends? But thou passest away in thy murmuring blast, the wind whistles through the gray hairs of Ossian. But most of all, those changes of moon and sheets of hurrying vapor and black clouds, with a sense of rapid action and weird silence, recall the far-back heirs' belief that such above were the preparations for receiving the wraiths of just slain warriors. We sat that night in Selma round the strength of the shell. The wind was abroad in the oaks. The spirit of the mountain roared. The blast came rustling through the hall and gently touched my harp. The sound was mournful and low like the song of the tomb. Fingal heard it first. The crowded sighs of his bosom rose. Some of my heroes are low, said the gray-haired king of Morven. I hear the sound of death on the harp. Ossian, touch the trembling string. Bid the sorrow rise, that their spirits may fly with joy to Morven's woody hills. I touched the harp before the king. The sound was mournful and low. Bend forward from your clouds, I said, ghosts of my fathers, bend. Lay by the red terror of your course. Receive the falling chief, whether he comes from a distant land or rises from the rolling sea. Let his robe of mist be near, his spear that is formed of a cloud. Place a half-extinguished meteor by his side, in the form of a hero's sword, and, oh, let his countenance be lovely, that his friends may delight in his presence. Bend from your clouds, I said, ghosts of my fathers, bend. Such was my song in Selma to the lightly trembling harp. How or why I know not, just at the moment, but I too muse and think of my best friends in their distant homes, of William O'Connor, of Maurice Buck, of John Burroughs, and of Mrs. Gilchrist, friends of my soul, stanchest friends of my other soul, my poems. Only a new ferry boat. January 12, 82. Such a show as the Delaware presented an hour before sundown yesterday evening, all along between Philadelphia and Camden, is worth weaving into an item. It was full tide, a fair breeze from the southwest, the water of a pale tawny color, and just enough motion to make things frolicsome and lively. Add to these an approaching sunset of unusual splendor, a broad tumble of clouds, with much golden haze and profusion of beaming shaft and dazzle. In the midst of all, in the clear drab of the afternoon light, there steamed up the river the large new boat, the Winona, as pretty an object as you could wish to see, lightly and swiftly skimming along, all trim and white, covered with flags, transparent red and blue, streaming out in the breeze. Only a new ferry boat, and yet in its fitness comparable with the prettiest product of nature's cunning, and rivaling it. 
high up in the transparent ether gracefully balanced and circled four or five great seahawks, while here below, amid the pomp and picturesqueness of sky and river, swam this creation of artificial beauty and motion and power, in its way no less perfect. Death of Longfellow. Camden, April, 82. I have just returned from an old forest haunt, where I love to go occasionally away from parlors, pavements, and the newspapers and magazines, and where, of a clear forenoon, deep in the shade of pines and cedars and a tangle of old laurel trees and vines, the news of Longfellow's death first reached me. For want of anything better, let me lightly twine a sprig of this sweet ground ivy trailing so plentifully through the dead leaves at my feet with reflections of that half-hour alone, there in the silence, and lay it as my contribution on the dead bard's grave. Longfellow, in his voluminous works, seems to me not only to be eminent in the style and forms of poetical expression that mark the present age, an idiosyncrasy, almost a sickness of verbal melody, but to bring what is always dearest as poetry to the general human heart and taste, and probably must be so in the nature of things. He is certainly the sort of bard and counteractant most needed for our materialistic, self-assertive, money-worshipping Anglo-Saxon races, and especially for the present age in America, an age tyrannically regulated with reference to the manufacturer, the merchant, the financier, the politician, and the day workman, for whom and among whom he comes as the poet of melody, courtesy, deference, poet of the mellow twilight of the past in Italy, Germany, Spain, and in Northern Europe, poet of all sympathetic gentleness, and universal poet of women and young people. I should have to think long if I were asked to name the man who has done more, and in more valuable directions, for America. I doubt if there ever was before such a fine intuitive judge and selector of poems. His translations of many German and Scandinavian pieces are said to be better than the vernaculars. He does not urge or lash. His influence is like good drink or air. He is not tepid either, but always vital, with flavor, motion, grace. He strikes a splendid average, and does not sing exceptional passions or humanity's jagged escapades. He is not revolutionary, brings nothing offensive or new, does not deal hard blows. On the contrary, his songs soothe and heal, or if they excite, it is a healthy and agreeable excitement. His very anger is gentle is at second hand, as in the quadroon girl and the witnesses. There is no undue element of pensiveness in Longfellow's strains. Even in the early translation, the Manrique, the movement is as of strong and steady wind or tide, holding up and buoying. Death is not avoided through his many themes, but there is something almost winning in his original verses and renderings on that dread subject, as closing the happiest land dispute. And then the landlord's daughter up to heaven raised her hand, and said, Ye may no more contend, there lies the happiest land. To the ungracious complaint charge of his want of racy nativity and special originality, I shall only say that America and the world may well be reverently thankful, can never be thankful enough, for any such singing bird vouchsafed out of the centuries without asking that the notes be different from those of other songsters, adding what I have heard Longfellow himself say, that ere the new world can be worthily original and announce herself and her own heroes, she must be well saturated with the originality of others, and respectfully consider the heroes that lived before Agamemnon. End of chapter 18《Chapter 19 of Specimen Days》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Myers《Specimen Days》by Walt Whitman — Chapter 19 — Starting Newspapers — Reminiscences from the Camden Courier as I sat taking my evening sail across the Delaware in the staunch ferry-boat Beverly a night or two ago, I was joined by two young reporter friends. 
I have a message for you, said one of them. The sea folks told me to say they would like a piece signed by your name to go in their first number. Can you do it for them? I guess so, said I. What might it be about? Well, anything on newspapers, or perhaps what you've done yourself, starting them. And off the boys went, for we had reached the Philadelphia side. The hour was fine and mild, the bright half-moon shining, Venus with excess of splendor just setting in the west, and the great scorpion rearing its length more than half up in the southeast. As I crossed leisurely for an hour in the pleasant night scene, my young friend's words brought up quite a string of reminiscences. I commenced when I was but a boy of eleven or twelve writing sentimental bits for the old Long Island Patriot in Brooklyn. This was about 1832. Soon after, I had a piece or two in George P. Morris's then celebrated and fashionable Mirror of New York City. I remember with what half-suppressed excitement I used to watch for the big, fat, red-faced, slow-moving, very old English carrier who distributed the Mirror in Brooklyn. And when I got one, opening and cutting the leaves with trembling fingers, how it made my heart double beat to see my piece on the pretty white paper in nice type. My first real venture was the Long Islander, in my own beautiful town of Huntington in 1839. I was about twenty years old. I had been teaching country school for two or three years in various parts of Suffolk and Queens counties, but liked printing, had been at it while a lad, learned the trade of compositor, and was encouraged to start a paper in the region where I was born. I went to New York, bought a press and types, hired some little help, but did most of the work myself, including the press work. Everything seemed turning out well. Only my own restlessness prevented me gradually establishing a permanent property there. I bought a good horse, and every week went all round the country serving my papers, devoting one day and night to it. I never had happier jaunts, going over to Southside, to Babylon, down the South Road, across to Smithtown and Comac, and back home. The experiences of those jaunts, the dear old-fashioned farmers and their wives, the stops by the hayfields, the hospitality, nice dinners, occasional evenings, the girls, the rides through the brush, come up in my memory to this day. I next went to the Aurora Daily in New York City, a sort of freelance. Also wrote regularly for the Tatler, an evening paper. With these and a little outside work, I was occupied off and on until I went to edit the Brooklyn Eagle, where for two years I had one of the pleasantest sits of my life, a good owner, good pay, and easy work and hours. The troubles in the Democratic Party broke forth about those times, 1848-49, and I split off with the Radicals, which led to rows with the boss and the party, and I lost my place. Being now out of a job, I was offered impromptu, it happened between the acts one night in the lobby of the old Broadway Theater near Pearl Street, New York City, a good chance to go down to New Orleans on the staff of the Crescent, a daily to be started there with plenty of capital behind it. One of the owners, who was north buying material, met me walking in the lobby, and though that was our first acquaintance, after fifteen minutes' talk and a drink, we made a formal bargain and he paid me two hundred dollars down to bind the contract and bear my expenses to New Orleans. I started two days afterwards, had a good leisurely time as the paper wasn't to be out in three weeks. I enjoyed my journey in Louisiana life much. Returning to Brooklyn a year or two afterward, I started the Freeman, first as a weekly, then daily. Pretty soon the secession war broke out, and I, too, got drawn in the current southward, and spent the following three years there, as memorandized preceding. Besides starting them as aforementioned, I have had to do, one time or another during my life, with a long list of papers at diverse places, sometimes under queer circumstances. During the war, the hospitals at Washington, among other means of amusement, printed a little sheet among themselves, surrounded by wounds and death, the Armory Square Gazette to which I contributed. 
The same long afterward, casually to a paper, I think it was called the Jimplicute, out in Colorado, where I stopped at the time. When I was in Quebec province in Canada in 1880, I went into the queerest little old French printing office near Tadoussac. It was far more primitive and ancient than my Camden friend William Kurtz's place up on Federal Street. I remember as a youngster several characteristic old printers of a kind hard to be seen these days. The Great Unrest of Which We Are Part My thoughts went floating on vast and mystic currents as I sat today in solitude and half-shade by the creek, returning mainly to two principal centers. One of my cherished themes for a never-achieved poem has been the two impetuses of man and the universe. In the latter, creation's incessant unrest, exfoliation, Darwin's evolution, I suppose. Indeed, what is nature but change, in all its visible and still more its invisible processes? Or what is humanity in its faith, love, heroism, poetry, even morals, but emotion. Note. Fifty thousand years ago the constellation of the Great Bear or Dipper was a starry cross. A hundred thousand years hence the imaginary Dipper will be upside down, and the stars which form the bowl and handle will have changed places. The misty nebulae are moving, and besides are whirling around in great spirals, some one way, some another. Every molecule of matter in the whole universe is swinging to and fro. Every particle of ether which fills space is in jelly-like vibration. Light is one kind of motion, heat another, electricity another, magnetism another, sound another. Every human sense is the result of motion. Every perception, every thought is but motion of the molecules of the brain translated by that incomprehensible thing we call mind. The processes of growth, of existence, of decay, whether in worlds or in the minutest organisms, are but motion. By Emerson's Grave, May 6, 82 We stand by Emerson's new-made grave without sadness, indeed a solemn joy and faith, almost hotter, our sole venison, no mere warrior rest thy task is done. For one beyond the warriors of the world lies surely symboled here, a just man, poised on himself, all loving, all enclosing, and sane and clear as the sun. Nor does it seem so much Emerson himself we are here to honor. It is conscience, simplicity, culture, humanity's attributes at their best, yet applicable, if need be, to average affairs, and eligible to all. So use are we to suppose a heroic death can only come from out of battle or storm, or mighty personal contest, or amid dramatic incidents or danger. Have we not been taught so for ages by all the plays and poems? that few even of those who most sympathizingly mourn Emerson's late departure will fully appreciate the ripened grandeur of that event, with its play of calm and fitness, like evening light on the sea. How I shall henceforth dwell on the blessed hours, when not long since I saw that benignant face, the clear eyes, the silently smiling mouth, the form yet upright in its great age to the very last, with so much spring and cheeriness, and such an absence of decrepitude that even the term, venerable, hardly seemed fitting. Perhaps the life now rounded and completed in its mortal development, and which nothing can change or harm more, has its most illustrious halo, not in its splendid intellectual or aesthetic products, but as forming in its entirety one of the few, alas how few, perfect and flawless excuses for being of the entire literary class. We can say, as Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg, it is not we who come to consecrate the dead. We reverently come to receive, if so it may be, some consecration to ourselves and daily work from him. 
At present writing, personal. A letter to a German friend, extract. May 31st, 82. From today, I enter upon my 64th year. The paralysis that first affected me nearly 10 years ago has since remained with varying course, seems to have settled quietly down, and will probably continue. I easily tire, am very clumsy, cannot walk far, but my spirits are first rate. I go around in public almost every day, now and then take long trips, by railroad or boat, hundreds of miles, live largely in the open air, am sunburnt and stout, weigh a hundred and ninety, keep up my activity and interest in life, people, progress, and the questions of the day. About two-thirds of the time I am quite comfortable. What mentality I ever had remains entirely unaffected. Though physically I am a half-paralytic and likely to be so long as I live. But the principal object of my life seems to have been accomplished. I have the most devoted and ardent of friends and affectionate relatives, and of enemies I really make no account. After Trying a Certain Book I tried to read a beautifully printed and scholarly volume on The Theory of Poetry, received by mail this morning from England, but gave it up at last for a bad job. Here are some capricious pencilings that followed, as I find them in my notes. In youth and maturity, poems are charged with sunshine and varied pomp of day. But as the soul more and more takes precedence, the sensuous still included, the dusk becomes the poet's atmosphere. I, too, have sought and ever seek the brilliant sun and make my songs according. But as I grow old, the half-lights of evening are far more to me. The play of imagination with the sensuous objects of nature for symbols and faith, with love and pride as the unseen impetus and moving power of all, make up the curious chess game of a poem. Common teachers or critics are always asking, what does it mean? Symphony of fine musician, or sunset, or sea waves rolling up the beach, what do they mean? Undoubtedly, in the most subtle, elusive sense, they mean something, as love does, and religion does, and the best poem. But who shall fathom and define those meanings? I do not intend this as a warrant for wildness and frantic escapades but to justify the soul's frequent joy in what cannot be defined to the intellect part, or to calculations. At its best, poetic lore is like what may be heard of conversation in the dusk from speakers far or hid, of which we get only a few broken murmurs. What is not gathered is far more, perhaps the main thing. Grandest poetic passages are only to be taken at free removes, as we sometimes look for stars at night, not by gazing directly toward them, but off one side. To a poetic student and friend, I only seek to put you in rapport. Your own brain, heart, evolution, must not only understand the matter, but largely supply it. Final Confessions Literary Tests so draw near their end these garrulous notes. There have doubtless occurred some repetitions, technical errors in the consecutiveness of dates, in the minutia of botanical, astronomical, and so on, exactness, and perhaps elsewhere. For in gathering up, writing, peremptorily dispatching copy, this hot weather, last of July and through August, 82, and delaying not the printers, I have had to hurry along, no time to spare. But in the deepest veracity of all, in reflections of objects, scenes, nature's outpourings, to my senses and receptivity as they seem to me, in the work of giving those who care for it some authentic glimpse, specimen days of my life, and in the bona fide spirit and relations from author to reader, on all the subjects designed and as far as they go, I feel to make unmitigated claims. The synopsis of my early life, Long Island, New York City, and so forth, and the diary jottings of the Secession War, tell their own story. 
My plan, in starting what constitutes most of the middle of the book, was originally for hints and data of a nature poem that should carry one's experiences a few hours, commencing at noon flush and so through the after part of the day. I suppose led to such an idea by my own life afternoon now arrived. But I soon found I could move at more ease by giving the narrative at first hand. Then there is a humiliating lesson one learns in serene hours of a fine day or night. Nature seems to look on all fixed-up poetry and art as something almost impertinent. Thus I went on, years following, various seasons and areas, spinning forth my thought beneath the night and stars, or, as I was confined to my room by half-sickness, or at midday looking out upon the sea, or far north steaming over the Saguenay's black breast, jotting all down in the loosest sort of chronological order, and here printing from my impromptu notes, hardly even the seasons grouped together, or anything corrected, so afraid of dropping what smack of outdoors or sun or starlight might cling to the lines, I dared not try to meddle with or smooth them. Every now and then, not often, but for a foil, I carried a book in my pocket, or perhaps tore out from some broken or cheap edition a bunch of loose leaves, most always had something of the sort ready, but only took it out when the mood demanded. In that way, utterly out of reach of literary conventions, I reread many authors. I cannot divest my appetite of literature, yet I find myself eventually trying it all by nature, first premises, many call it but really the crowning results of all, laws, tallies, and proofs. Has it never occurred to anyone how the last deciding tests applicable to a book are entirely outside of technical and grammatical ones, and that any truly first-class production has little or nothing to do with the rules and calibers of ordinary critics, or the bloodless chalk of Alibone's dictionary? I have fancied the ocean and the daylight, the mountain and the forests, putting their spirit and a judgment on our books. I have fancied some disembodied human soul giving its verdict. Nature and Democracy, Morality Democracy most of all affiliates with the open air, is sunny and hardy and sane only with nature, just as much as art is. Something is required to temper both, to check them, restrain them from excess, morbidity. I have wanted, before departure, to bear special testimony to a very old lesson in requisite. American democracy, in its myriad personalities, in factories, workshops, stores, offices, through the dense streets and houses of cities and all their manifold sophisticated life, must either be fibered, vitalized by regular contact with outdoor light and air and gross, farm scenes, animals, fields, trees, birds, sun warmth and free skies, or it will certainly dwindle and pale. We cannot have grand races of mechanics, work people, and commonality, the only specific purpose of America, on any less terms. I conceive of no flourishing and heroic elements of democracy in the United States, or of democracy maintaining itself at all, without the nature element forming a main part, to be its health element and beauty element, to really underlie the whole politics, sanity, religion, and art of the new world. Finally, the morality. Virtue, said Marcus Aurelius, what is it? only a living and enthusiastic sympathy with nature. Perhaps, indeed, the efforts of the true poets, founders, religions, literatures, all ages, have been and ever will be, our time and times to come, essentially the same, to bring people back from their persistent strains and sickly abstractions to the costless average, divine, original, concrete. End of chapter 19 Section 20 of Specimen Days This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Specimen Days by Walt Whitman. Section 20. Collect one or two index items. Though the ensuing collect and preceding specimen days are both largely from memoranda already existing, the hurried peremptory needs of copy for the printers already referred to, the musician's story of a composer up in a garret, rushing the middle body and last of his school together, while the fiddlers are playing the first parts down in the concert room. Of this haste, while quite willing to get the consequent stimulus of life and motion, I am sure there must have resulted sundry technical errors. If any are too glaring, they will be corrected in a future edition. A special word about pieces in early youth at the end, on jaunts over Long Island, as boy and young fellow, nearly half a century ago, I heard of, or came across, in my own experience, characters, true occurrences, incidents, which I tried my prentice hand at recording. I was then quite an abolitionist, an advocate of the temperance and anti-capital punishment causes, and published during occasional visits to New York City. A majority of the sketches appeared first in the Democratic Review, others in the Columbian Magazine, or the American Review of that period. My serious wish were to have all those crude and boyish pieces quietly dropped in oblivion, but to avoid the annoyance of their surreptitious issue, as lately announced from outsiders. I have, with some qualms, tacked them on here. A doe-faced song came out first in the evening post, Blood Mary, and wounded in the house of friends, in the tribute, Poetry Today in America, etc., first appeared, under the name of the Poetry of the Future, in the North American Review, for February 1881, a memorandum at a venture, in same periodical, some time afterward. Several of the convalescent outdoor scenes and literary items preceding originally appeared in the fortnightly critic of New York. End of Specimen Days by Walt Whitman